Well, come on, I believe something good is going to happen to you tonight. Amen? Something good. I'll tell you, I don't believe revival is coming. I'm telling you, revival isn't coming. Revival isn't coming. Revival isn't coming. Revival isn't coming. I'm telling you, revival is here. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap for everything he's done this week. Amen? Oh, you've been too good, Jesus. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Come on, how many of y'all were ministered to over the last few days? I mean, I'll tell you, I, I'm ministered to and uh, been ministered to. And before I move on in the service, uh, I just, I want to I wanna prophesy for just a, a, a moment. And uh, somebody give me an ink pen. Anybody got an ink pen right now? Somebody give me an ink pen. Give me an ink pen, all right? All um, right. I'm not, I wish I could do what Gustavo does with this ink pen, but I'm not, I'm not going to try that tonight, but I'm going to do something pretty cool. All right, come here. My brother, put this pen. I'm taking, you don't get your ink pen back, all right? This is my ink pen now. Whose ink pen was this? Jan, Miss Jane, you'll get blessed, all right? All right, you'll get blessed. Uh, I want you to take this ink pen in your hand. Now, I want you to grab it. I want your wife to grab that ink pen as well. You guys grab a hold of that, that pen. Now, lift a hand, the other hand to heaven if you can. And I, I see you with pen to paper. And I see the Spirit of God on you, leading you and guiding you. And the Spirit of God says, I'm giving you, you already have part of it, but I'm giving you more of a plan to prosper, says the Lord of hosts. And even as I gave the patriarchs in the book of Genesis a plan to prosper, I gave my servant a plan to prosper, and he put a certain type of rod in front of the flocks, and his flocks began to increase, and his life began to flourish, and my hand came upon him in such a strong way, those that dwelt and lived around him became jealous of what I'd done in him. Now I'm going to do the same thing in you, says the Lord, for the blessing of Abraham is on your life, and the curse of the law has been utterly broken. And I'll put Put my hand on you and your children, says the Lord. And even your children's children. I see three generations of distinct blessing flowing from the hand of God even now. And then the third generation, says the Lord, I see a powerful, powerful, powerful man of God. See, prophesies, I see walls falling down. I see him calling out national and international judgments that come from the throne of God. I see people coming and drinking of the spirit that flows from the innermost part of his being. And I see your children blessed in a miraculous way. I see your life. You got a life that's a good life. God's going to take the two of you through the course. You're not going to miss a step. I'm telling you, he's going to lead you and guide you, and your life's going to be a blessed one. You're going to live in a land that flows with milk and with honey. You're going to taste the abundance and the goodness of God. Not just the abundance in the natural realm. The Spirit of God says, I'll pour out my abundance to you in the spiritual realm as well. You will know me in a special way. You'll walk with me and talk with me for I'm drawing you to me this day, says the Lord of hosts. I'll be with you and you will be in me and you'll see things like my servant Moses did as I hit him in the cleft of the rock and passed by and showed him my glory. Spirit of God says he'll show you in your household his glory, the goodness of God, and a legacy from the hand of the Lord will be your song, says the Lord of hosts. Come on, somebody give God. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap. I said God is here. 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 Somebody lift a hand to heaven right now. Come on, 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 come on. We love you, Lord Jesus. I see a, I see a, I see a weariness. I see a heaviness. I see something that's been riding you that doesn't have an authority to be on your life anymore. For your mind, says the Lord of hosts. God's breaking every bit of depression. He's breaking every bit of anxiety. He's breaking everything the world put on you. It's coming off of you. The things that the devil tried to put on you, they're coming off of you. And everything God wants on you is coming on you tonight, says the Lord of hosts. God says, I'm going to restore a joy to you. It's a joy you don't even know yet, but it's coming to you. It's a joy unspeakable. It's full of glory. Now I say a night of mourning is over. 
and a brand new sun is coming up on the horizon of your life. So I break that spirit of grief. I break that spirit of depression. I take authority over it, and I command it to leave your life and to never return. I say the joy of the Lord. Be filled with joy, 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 unspeakable joy and full of the glory of God. Unspeakable joy. Come on, just lift your other hand. Tell him you receive it. I receive unspeakable joy. Rabba Masaseke. Full of the glory, full of the glory, full of the glory. Full of the glory, full of the glory. Full of the glory of God. Hey, how many of y'all want the glory of God in your life? Amen. How many of y'all like the joy of the Lord? Amen. Come on, a merry heart does good like a medicine. Amen. Just turn to your neighbor, tell him I'm happy. Huh? Come on. Come on, somebody say, I've got joy. Turn to your other neighbor and tell them you're happy, darn it, right now. Tell them that, huh? We're the happiest people around, amen? Come on, I'm happy. Sometimes I just look at myself and I say I'm happy in the mirror, right? On days I'm especially not happy, I call myself happy. You're happy. Huh? You're happy right there, amen? Come on, happy. You know why I say I'm happy? Some people say, you know, well, joy, you have that from Jesus, but happiness is because of your happenings. But the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says, happy is he whose God is the Lord. Is God any of your Lord out there tonight, huh? Come on, everybody say this, happy is he whose God is the Lord's. Man, I feel like dealing with that right now. There's some of you that, that you've carried, and man, that, that comes after a lot of people, right? I mean... I, I know I've fought. How many of y'all have ever fought against depression trying to move in on you? I've fought against depression trying to move in on me. And uh, you got to fight that thing. You can't let it take residence in your life. Because Christians, really, we don't, have a, we don't have any right to be depressed anymore. Amen? It's going to try. I mean, I'm not saying it won't take a shot at you. But we don't have a right to be depressed anymore. Right? Everything Jesus did for us, one thing I know is that I am not a victim of depression. I'm not a victim of sin. I'm not a victim of anything in this world. I'm a victor now because I'm seated in Christ. And those things don't have authority in my life anymore. Come on, we got joy. Amen? And sometimes I just laugh by faith. Ha, 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 right? Just laugh by faith till I'm happy. Well, some of you got this depression thing keeps coming in your house. And I feel led of the Lord, we're going to break it off your life right now. Nothing to be ashamed of, I'm telling you. I've fought it at times. I got funky and depressed one time for almost two years, right? I haven't made a mixtape. I'm showing my age because nobody's made a mixtape since I don't know when. Uh, I don't know what it is. We don't even have CDs anymore. We have downloads, right? But, but I made a mixtape of all the music my dad listened to when he died, and I'd listen to that, and I, I missed him. And you know, it's okay to miss somebody, but you can't die because they died. How I many know there's still a lot of life to live? Amen. And I got like that for about two years till finally it's like Jesse's like, you're not going to beat. You throw that tape out. You're not listening to that seat anymore. Change your sweater. You've had it on for three days now. It's like you're not staying here. Is this not where you were designed to live? So I'll tell you, Jesse came to me as a deliverer that day. Jesus is here as a deliverer as well. If you got that kind of thing that comes at your life, I want you to come to this altar right now. We're going to pray over it. We're going to break it before I move right in. I'll tell you, just go ahead and get up and come. Come on, don't be embarrassed. It's not, I know there's, there's, there's a bunch of you out there. Be bold. Thank you, John Tatum. It's the word of the day is bold. Amen? Come on. Come on, y'all give them a hand clap as they come. I mean, the lights are up. <laughs> Worship band's not even all in, right? They're up there. A lot of times it's like we got to get the environment right for people to respond because people are so freaked out by others seeing them. Come on, but we're family in here, amen? I want Pastor Patrick. I want uh, Jesse, Pastor Jesse. I want, I want... We don't call each other Pastor Jesse and Brian, but she's a pastor, right? It's a little weird. Uh, I want Pastor Rand. Come help me, sir. Come lay hands on people. We're going to break this thing off of your life right now. How many of y'all believe that Jesus can break the back 
of depression out of your life tonight? How many believe that Jesus is big enough to take that cloud off of your life tonight? How many think Jesus is big enough to break anxiety out of you tonight? Somebody say, I believe it. Now just say this out loud. Say, Father, I thank you. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I declare I'm free of depression. I'm free of anxiety. I'm free of that cloud. I speak to that spirit. And I command it to leave my life. And I receive the joy of the Lord. It is my strength tonight, now, in Jesus' mighty name. Now just lead us, Tiffany. We're going to lay hands on them. Come on. I break its power in Jesus' mighty name. I break its power in Jesus. I break its power. I break its power. I break its power. Go, 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 go. I break its power. Raha said it. I break its power. I break its power. I break its power. Go, 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 go. Raha said it. She ha bra ba ta bra. to heaven for one more second. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. I thank you for the anointing, Father, to be different from the world. I declare our difference in this house. Lord, I thank you that we're a special people. We're a royal priesthood. We're your chosen people and that we're set apart and we're different. We thank you tonight that you use us, Lord, to restore and to change the entire region. I declare a change coming to our city. I declare a change coming to our families. I declare a change coming to our church. I declare a change coming to the state of Kentucky. I declare a change coming to Texas. I declare a change coming to America in the name of Jesus. Now, Daniel Bracken, if you're listening, you hear the word of the Lord. But if you're not on here, we're going to send it to you, all right? Daniel Bracken, I, I, I see that building you've started. And the Lord says he brought you to grace to start it, and he'll give you the grace to complete it in the name of Jesus. Who are you, O mountain? 
before Zerubbabel you shall become as a plain, and he will bring up the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. The glory of God is coming to Wasilla, Alaska. Revival's coming. You're going to turn that state upside down in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hear the word of the Lord. Come on, somebody shout grace, grace to it. Grace, grace to it. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Just tell them something good is going to happen to you tonight. Amen. I'm going to preach. Y'all ready to preach now? Is anybody ready for the word of the Lord? Or are you preached out this week? Surely you're not preached out yet. Amen. Come on. You've been waiting all day to get in here right now. We're going to preach. This is a revival. If you got your Bible on you, I want you to open it up to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19. Garvin, just keep flowing over there. Play a little bit for me. Help me out. How many of y'all appreciate Garvin coming from Amarillo, Texas? I love Garvin. Garvin, can you play something like old school churchy for a second? Can you show some of that off with that? It's pretty good, isn't it? Amen. Y'all give Garvin a hand clap. I love a musician to set the tone of your life. Now, I think what revival does is it sets the tone of the church, right? How many know, like, the tone or what they're playing in a movie? You kind of know what's coming, right? Play something eerie, Garvin. Play, like, the Jaws theme or something like that. Come on. Right? Now, we know it's bad news if you hear that in somebody's life, right? Right, right there. And now, if you play something uh, a little more happy, right? We got something happy? All right, yeah, that's happy. And uh, I think it's up to us to set the tone of our life. You set the station, amen? You tune in what you want. You make a decision, right? You can change the tone in your car. You guys that listen to metal over there, you turn it on, you start speeding, don't you? Huh? I know I do. I've got some tickets listening to like something really hard. It's like, sir, you were going 98. I'm like, no, surely not. Uh, it wasn't me. The music made me do it. Amen, right? So you better pick the tone wisely. And I think it's a, um, it's a tone-changing night for our lives. 1 Kings chapter 19, I'm going to tell you the story about two prophets, all right, Elijah and Elisha, two of the most powerful prophets in the Old Testament. Here's when the second one gets called by the first one. 1 Kings 19 verse 19 says this, it's talking about Elijah, so he departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and says, Please, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow you. And he said to him, Go back again for what have I done to you? The Amplified Version says he said that as a test to Elisha. So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and he followed Elijah, and he became his servant. Now, Elijah is one of the most powerful prophets you can read about in the Old Testament. The things Elijah got done were amazing. God moved him supernaturally. He was the head prophet in Israel during his time. And back then there were many prophets and they had sons. It's called the sons of the prophets. And it was like a prophetic school where they would train a generation of prophetic voices to prophesy the word of God to Israel. Man, I declare his church is going to train a generation of prophetic voices to learn to prophesy the word of the Lord to America. Come on, come on, and around the world, to Asia, to Central America. We're going to prophesy the word of the Lord. And so Elijah had given his life to this. Elijah has 14 massive miracles that are recorded. More than that, but they're the ones that are recorded. He caused the rain to cease 
in the heavens. He was fed supernaturally by ravens. These are just a few of them. He did the miracle of the barrel of meal and the cruise of oil. He resurrected a widow's son. He called fire from heaven down on the altar. He prophesied that it would rain again, it rained again. He prophesied that Ahab's sons would be destroyed, and they were. He said Jezebel would be eaten by dogs by the Spirit of God. And it happened. He prophesied that a Hazai would die of an illness. He brought fire down and consumed 50 soldiers that came out to get him. He did the same thing a second time. He parted the Jordan. He prophesied that Elisha would have a double portion of his mantle. And he was also caught up to heaven with a whirlwind. Come on, that's a pretty cool exit strategy. How many of y'all would rather go in a whirlwind than in a hearse? Can I get an amen out there, right? I'm calling down a whirlwind when I go. Amen. And um, this man was powerful. You know, the Bible says that he was also a man after our own nature. Turn to your neighbor and tell him Elijah was like you, right? He wasn't perfect. He was messed up. Right after the Bible says that, it says that, that he shut the heavens. Book of James talks about it. Prophesied and shut the heavens. Then he turned around and said, he's a man like you. And he said, the effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. James said, if Elijah can shut the heavens, you can shut the heavens with your prayers. Elijah said, uh, James said, if Elijah can open the heavens, you can open the heavens with your prayers. Does anybody believe that their prayers have the power? Come on, do you believe it? If you believe it, your prayers will be powerful. If you don't believe it, you might as well not pray. Come on, believe it if you're going to pray. Now get an amen out there. I've told this story a million times, but I, I, I love this story. I love this story. And uh, you guys are probably tired of hearing it, but it just illustrates a childlike faith and, and, and what, you, what you can get. And Briley was getting ready to turn 10. She's riding in the back of the car. She looks up at me and says, Dad, I know what I want for my 10th birthday. And I say, well, honey, that's great. What do you want? How many of you guys want clues from the women in your family and your life and your daughters on what they want, and you just write it down, you go get it, and you don't have to think about it? Now get an amen. You guys that haven't figured that out yet, you start listening, because I promise you they're telling you what to buy them. If you'll listen, you'll win. If you don't listen, you lose in life. Amen? I remember Jesse, uh, stockings are a big deal for her uh, on Christmas morning. And she always prepped me before Christmas to give me some firing, you know, a, a, a warning shot. She fires a warning shot. It's like, Brian, get my stuff for my stocking or we're going to be mad come Christmas, right? She doesn't say it like that, but I can read between the lines. And I'll never forget one year I got up and I forgot to buy the stuff for a stocking. It's Christmas morning. So I get up and I realize it and she's got this elaborate stocking. I mean, my stocking uh, runneth over all over the house, right? And I have nothing. So I take off down. The only place I could find open was a convenience store. So that year I got her an oil funnel and some beef jerky and I stuck it in her stocking and it all smelled like fried chicken, right? On Christmas morning, she was not happy with her stocking. All right, so pay attention. But Briley says, I know what I want for my birthday. I say, what's that? She says, I want to go to Disney World for my 10th birthday. And I'm like, oh, brother, God help me, you know? I'm like, Briley, you gotta manage your expectations for a birthday. So you get a cake, you get a doll, you don't get a trip to Disney World for your birthday because that mouse is full of the devil. I believe that. He's going to cost you 10 grand to feel that magic, and I know it. I hate that mouse. Nah, I love the mouse. Last time I went down there, my feet bled, right? I don't want to go by. I'm going to take my grandchildren there someday. But uh, anyway, um, so, so she says that, and I say, nah, you're, you're, honey, you're not getting a trip to Disney World for your birthday. And she looks up, and she says, well, Dad... You might not take me to Disney World for my birthday, but I'm going to pray to Jesus, and he's going to take me to Disney World for my birthday. And I'm like, how am I going to tell this kid she's not going to Disney World for her birthday, and Jesus is not answering that prayer because I say no. So she prays this Kenneth Copeland-type prayer in the back. She says, Lord, I thank you that if I pray in faith and I believe to receive, I can have whatever I pray for. And right now I pray and I believe that I receive a trip to Disney World in the name of Jesus. And she started binding and loosing and pulling down spiritual principalities and powers and, 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 and saying, I'm going to ride those rides. I'm going to wear those ears. I'm, gonna, I'm going to Disney World in Jesus' name. And I'm still like, she ain't going to Disney World, right? 30 seconds later, I promise you, she said that amen my phone rang, and I looked down at it, and it was an Orlando, Florida area code. 
I pick it up, put it to my ear, and it's a friend of mine, Caleb Worley, pastors of church down there. And he says, Brian, all of a sudden, I was just thinking about you. And I called to see if you would come preach for me on May the 29th. You know when Briley's birthday is? May the 30th. Come on, somebody give God. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man and woman, it avails much. God was teaching Briley how to pray in faith and receive. One day for kids, it might be Mickey Mouse ears. Tomorrow, I'm telling you, it's going to be nations come to the glory of God. I turned around. She was listening to it. She smiled at me real big, and she said, Jesus loves me. That's what she said. Come on. Come on. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them Jesus loves you, too. Just tell them that tonight. Amen? Talking to Elijah. Elijah prayed, shut the heavens. You can, too. You can, too. Come on. Somebody say, I can, too. You, you can, too. I promise you. And I'll tell you, we need a prophetic generation. We're living in the last days. We need some Elijahs and some Elishas to usher in what God wants to do in America, what God wants to do in our nation. It's a dark hour, but I'll tell you what, God's lifting up a light and the darkness will not prevail. For John said that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness will never overcome the light. The light is too powerful for the darkness that comes against your life. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot, will not, shall not, and never will overcome the light of God. Can't even comprehend the light. So Elijah walks by. And he takes his mantle. I left my mantle at home today. I wish I had it, but he takes his mantle. A prophet wore a mantle back in those days. He takes his mantle, and he goes to Elisha's farm by the word of the Lord. He's just come out of one of the toughest battles in his life. Almost broke down, almost gave up. God gave him grace. Got him up out of his own depression. The prophet was depressed. And sent him over to Elisha. Because I'll tell you, God doesn't want anybody to die in their cave. When you die in a cave, you don't touch the next generation. When you die in the cave, you don't finish the assignment. When you die in the cave, you just don't get it all done. We're not the kind of people that don't get it all done. Well, God is our alpha and our omega, our beginning and the end. He's the author and the finish, finisher. He's our genesis. He's our revelation. He is our A. He is our C. He completes what he starts in our life. God's going to complete what he starts in your life. Amen? We're finishers. And um, he goes down, he takes his mantle. Sees the young man's going to pick up his prophetic ministry. And he walks over to him and he throws his mantle on Elisha. And Elisha's got his first test he's going to pass to enter into the fullness of everything God wants to give him. The first test he has to pass is the test of the ox or the test of the old. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say the test of the old. It's a good way to say it. He's got to decide. I mean, he's there at his father's farm. They have a business. Things are going well. They have 12 yoke of oxen right there. They're plowing their own fields. They're successful people. He wasn't a bum looking for something to do. Neither was Jesus, by the way. Jesus was not a broke, busted bum. Jesus was a carpenter, a stonemason. His father had a business. He had a trade. He was a builder. Didn't look, wasn't looking for something to do, right? He had a plan, but he had a, an ability. Elisha was in the same thing. And so the prophet throws his mantle on him. Everybody knows what that is. He's calling him to come be a prophet. He just keeps walking off, Elisha does. He says, can I, can I go back and see my dad and my mom? He says, you do what you want. You hear what I said to you. And he doesn't. He stops right there and he burns that, 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 that uh, oxen joke, slaughters that ox, and come on, they have a sacrifice to God most high. And Elisha passes his first test. He passes the test of the old. Man, so many people fail the test of the old. They can't walk into the new that God has for them because they're so tethered to the old. I'm telling you, God's calling you to let the past be the past at last. Let every failure be in the past. Come on, let every success be in the past. Let all the mediocre days be in the past. As long as you're tethered to the past, you'll never go to your future. You can't win in your past. Your past is over, but you can win in your future. So you have to decide to walk away from the old. Some of you have some old relationships you need to slaughter, just like he slaughtered that oxen. Not literally, don't kill anybody. You hear what I'm saying? Some people say they want everything God has for them, but they won't even get rid of a loser friend that's been in their life for 15 years. That person's a loser. 
They're going to keep losing. You're going to lose with them if you stay tethered to them. Well, that's mean, Pastor. No, that's the word of the Lord, and that's true. Love them, but they don't have to, they don't have to roll with you, right? There's some people you just don't need to ride to the convenience store with. I've been a preacher for years now. I've been a Christian for 21 years. I've got a friend I still don't need to ride to the convenience store with at 21. My dad used to get in trouble with his dad. My older brother used to get in trouble with his older brother. I used to get in trouble with him. My nephew got in trouble with his nephew. And I'll tell you, my dad told me years ago, son, Gibson and Lovins don't need to be together when the sun goes down. You just don't need to do it, right? There's just some, I'm kidding, Jeremy. I love you out there right now. Makes good preaching though, doesn't it? And uh, I'll say this. It's like this, there's some old things you gotta bury to go forward. And the toughest thing about vision or going forward in life, it's not getting a picture of the future. It's what do you have to walk away from in your past. It's the toughest thing about going forward. There's some of you in this church still crying about people that left five years ago. Let the past be the past at last. Some of you are still talking about Second and Allen. That was in 2006. Let it be done. Some of you are still talking about what God did. Hey, that's buried and it's over. And the Lord says, I want to resurrect you. Will you let me do it? Let the past be the past at last. Stop embracing the old wineskin. You'll never have the new as long as you have the old. God's calling you out of that. Calling you out of that. Calling you out of that. Don't you let those words come out of your mouth again. Don't you say it. Don't you spray it. You take authority over your soul. Stop whining about the past. Hear the word of the Lord. As long as, you, as long as this church is tethered to the past, we'll never have a future. God's got a new wineskin for us and we're gonna walk into it. I said God's got a new wineskin for us and we're gonna walk into it. I said God's got a new wineskin for us and we're gonna walk into it. I said God's got a new wineskin for us and we're gonna walk into it. I said, God's got a new wineskin for us, and we're going to walk into it. God's got a new wineskin for us. Henderson, uh, God's got a new wineskin for all of you, and you are going to walk into it. Let the past be the past at last. Amen? It's true in ministry. It's true in life. You know, I'm thankful that God called me to, to be a preacher before I had anything to lose, Right? It's harder. Guys get older. They got, they got, and I'm not just talking about preaching. It's whatever God's calling you to, right? All of our calls are different. All have the same purpose to bring glory to God, right? It's all of our purpose, amen? Turn and tell somebody you exist to bring glory to God. That's what you're here for, amen? You exist to bring glory to God. But God does it all different in our lives. And, um, you know, I say that I say that I had nothing to lose, but I really did. So my dad had a very successful business. I always thought I would go into business. I'd do that after I'd partied all I wanted, right? That was what I was going to do. My brother's the businessman, the real businessman in the family. I'm the preacher, and uh, he carries me around. I'm a business partner that has no capital and very little work ethic, and he, he carries me all the time. Y'all give my brother Ben a big hand clap, right? And uh, he's called to business. I, 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 that's not my primary function. I love business, and I love businessmen. And business women, I understand them. I was raised by them, and I got a real heart for them. Uh, but my primary function was to be a preacher. And my dad had a very successful business, and I, I always knew I could go there. But the call of God for me was something else. And the business that we all thought we would have forever, <laughs> it's gone. <isn't> it? <laughs> we got a different one. That one's gone. We have a different one today. You got to be careful you don't put your hope into anything in this world. So it's all temporal, isn't it? Here one moment, gone the next. Kingdoms rise, kingdoms fall. There's one kingdom, the increase of his government, there'll be no end. And I'll tell you what, if you bind to what he tells you to do, doesn't matter what you walk away from, I'm telling you, your tomorrow will be greater than any of your yesterdays because he's a God that's gonna take you from faith to faith, glory to glory, and strength to strength. Come on, we're gonna pass the test of the old and we're going into the new. Second thing that could have knocked Elisha out is the test of on-the-job training. How many know you don't know anything about anything you're called to do till you're really on the job? The doctor in med school has no idea how to be a doctor. 
until he goes into his internship and he starts doing it. Tell you what, in seminary, they will not teach you how to pastor. I got an undergrad theology degree and part of a master's done. And I learned a lot of Bible knowledge, but they didn't teach me anything about being a pastor. Nothing. You know how you learn to pastor? You do it. How how many of y'all will admit that you learned it? I mean, how many of y'all say, hey, you learned what you learned when you got to the job? Amen? Teachers, what do they know whenever they're sitting in those elementary classes, right? They don't know anything until they're looking at a five-year-old that's got seven devils in their, in their life and is, is, you know, it's like Chucky from Child's Play in their classroom. Now we're learning something about child development, right? Right now. Now we're learning something. On the job training. On the job training is not perfect. Most people don't have the metal to get through it. And uh, Elisha has to follow Elijah. Scholars say at least, they, they argue, but it's somewhere from 11 to 20 years he followed, he followed that man of God. I've seen guys get a prophecy, hey, you're going to be a preacher in the future, and the next day they're like, well, when do I get to preach around here? I'm like, oh, about 12 to 14 years. Most of them, that's offensive to them. But I'll tell you what, if they can't get through that, forget about it. It's God's a God that will test your metal, see if you got the time to make it. People that want it quick, want it cheap, want it easy, they don't ever make the cut. People that'll follow. So literally, Elisha follows Elijah. The Bible says he pours water over the hands of the man of God. He serves the man of God. He gets the coffee. He goes down to the store. He takes care of the business, right? He does the meetings that Elijah doesn't want to take. Sometimes people would come to see the prophet and he would send down Elisha instead. Sorry, the prophet's busy, but you got me today. People don't want the assistant, they want the prophet. But I'm telling you, sometimes the prophet will do that to see, do you want God or do you want an appointment with the man you like to hear preach more? Do you want God or do you want, do you want to hear the preacher you like? Because the preacher you like can't perform the miracles, but the God of the preacher He's got the ability. What will Pastor Brian be preaching here? Did you come here for Pastor Brian or did you come here for Jesus? Because I'll tell you, if you knew all about Pastor Brian, you would say, Jesus, help Pastor Brian. Can I get an amen out there? Tell you what, I love you, but I feel feel honored tonight a little bit. And I I think it's the Spirit of God that's contending with a contentious thing. And um, this guy has to go on-the-job training. You know how my brother and I were trained? They should have been through our on-the-job training coming up, Ben. We'd be out in the stockyard sorting cattle. I mean, the guys out there in the stockyards were crazy. Sorry, Mom. (laughs) It's the truth. And uh, I remember you catch cattle. You're like sorting the steers off the heifers. So there's a guy or whatever. He's at the end of an alley with, let's say, 100 animals. And these cattle are running at you wide open. And one of them's a, a steer. You're taking them in a gate. And then you got to let the heifers go by. You got to close the gate. And, and my brother could do it as fast as anybody in the world until we both got fat. But he was real fast when, he, when we were young. And because uh, he's the quickest Gibson there's ever been. And, and my uncle were sorting cattle. If you missed a cow, he would take a sorting pole and throw it at your head down the alley. And so you learn to not miss and you learn to duck pretty fast until I got big enough to say, if you throw a pole at me one more time, I'm going to kill you. Help me, God, I'm coming after you. 18 years old, last time he ever threw a sorting pole at me too. And uh, it was on the job training. And when I got out in the work world now, I thought, man, all this is cake. What are people complaining about? They go home at night. We work till two every morning in the winter. See, uh, Elisha had to, he had to live through a lot of stuff. And how many of y'all think Elijah was, was perfect? Y'all think Elijah was a perfect prophet? You know, Elijah was a depressed prophet. Elijah, if you read his stories, almost shows signs of bipolar. One day he's calling down fire and he's defeating Jezebel. The next day he's running for his life from the same woman, hiding in a cave, asking God to kill him. This man served a bipolar prophet from 11 to 20 years. Now, I promise you it was not easy. 
but he stayed there. I'm telling you, if you're looking for a perfect uh, spouse, you're going to have trouble because a perfect spouse doesn't exist. If you're looking for a perfect preacher, there was only one, and he was crucified 2,000 years ago. If you're looking for a perfect church, good luck, because whenever we showed up, the church got messed up, right? That, that quest for perfect, but this man pushed through, and he pushed through the test of on-the-job training. He, he stayed at the church when people offended him. Come on, somebody. He stayed at the church through a building project where they took offerings. He stayed at the church whenever another kid back in the nursery bit the ear on his child like a Mike Tyson, right? Because it's coming. Every kid's going to bite another kid. And when your kid gets bit, I remember my kid got bit, and we had an older, somebody already had kids, said, be careful to, to Jesse, be careful, Jesse. I promise you, if you make a deal out of this, your kid's going to bite somebody next week, right? Next week, our sweet little Briley bit, bit somebody like a vampire in the back way back when, right? So that's what kids do. It feels good on your teeth. Come on, let me take a little bite out of you. And they stayed anyway. Man, third test that Elijah passed was the test of offense. And it was offensive. Elijah follows Elijah for 11 to 20 years, serving him. And it's time for Elijah to go into heaven. God had already started whispering in the ear of the other prophets that Elijah is going to heaven soon. They walk to one city and all the sons of the prophets come out to Elisha. And they say, do you know your master's going? He's leaving today, he's gone today, he's going to heaven today. And he says, shh, don't talk about that. And then Elijah turns around to Elisha and says, I have to go to another city. He has to go one time, he says Jericho. One time he says the Jordan. He says another city, I think Bethel. He says, no, you stay here, Elijah, because I'm going to Jericho. And you know what Elisha answers? He says, as my soul lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. He said, I've come this far, I'm not leaving you. Think how offensive. They go, they go, he goes with them. He tries to send him away after 11 or 20 years of service. This guy's going to get a, he wants a double portion of his anointing. He wants to do what he did. He wants to flow in what he flows in. He's been serving and fighting to become what that guy was from 11 to 20 years. And now that older prophet's trying to blow him off. He's going to heaven. He's not taking him with him. But maybe he's not blowing him off. Maybe he's testing him to see if he can hold what God is going to pour out on his life. Because if his metal hasn't been tested and he hasn't been tried, if he pours that kind of power on his life, it won't just destroy him it could destroy a nation you stay here goes to the next city and he he says listen you stay here I'm going to the next city and he says it again as my soul lives and as your soul lives I will not leave you I love that kind of resolve that's in it to win it Man, if God would give us 100 people in his church that had that kind of resolve that said, I'm in it to win it. Man, I'm going with you as my soul lives and as your soul lives, I won't let you go. I'm gonna stay till the gates of hell are pushed back, until the purposes of God are completed, until our prophetic destiny is fulfilled. Man, if I could have some people like that, I think I got some in this room. Come on. I think I, I, think I, I, think I got some in this room. Who's that kind of person in this room that can hang in the ring? Come on, is anybody out there that can stay in the fight for more than two minutes? Is there anybody out there that can endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus? Is there anybody out there that having done all to stand can stand there for by faith, lifting up the shield of the Spirit? Man, if we had people like that, we could stay in revival, couldn't we? Can you imagine? He does it to him three times. Elijah's got to be, Elisha's got to be thinking of all the crud you put me through, man. Now you're trying to walk on me when it's supposed to be my day of receiving your ministry? Man, I covered, I covered the, the, not the sinful stuff, but the weird stuff about you. I know your kids don't like you. I know you fight with your wife. I pick up your meds at the pharmacy for you. I know what you're taking. You're going to blow me off? He didn't do that. He kept right with him. He said, when you go, I want a double portion of your mantle. You know what, you know what, you know what the old prophet said? He says this to him. He says, if you see me when I go. I was talking to Gustavo, and uh, I got to tell you, that guy's the most powerful 
word of knowledge prophet guy that I've seen in the world. Has anybody ever seen a more stunning prophetic gift? I haven't. Max, Max is older than dirt. He hadn't seen it either, right? We hadn't seen it. I think, I think Mr. Evans used to travel with a guy like that, Jim Spillman. It's been since, what, the 80s since you've seen that kind of operation? And uh, I asked him, because I want to know how a guy flows like that, because I prophesy, right? And he's like the best I've ever seen at it. I'm like, tell me, tell me how you do that. And, and he tells me a little bit, but what he mainly says is, if you see me, son, you'll learn to do what I do. If you see me, you'll learn to do what I do. Just like Elijah said, if you see me when I go. The only way you pick up some things is you have to see somebody else operate in it. More is caught than taught, right? And he says, if you see me when I go, he says it to Elisha. That's where he got that statement. If you see me when I go, you'll learn to do what I do. Can I have a double portion of what you have? Man, that's a big ask. Strongest prophet ever. I don't just want what you have. I want twice as much as what you have. And he says, if you see me when I go. And they're walking and talking, having their last time together. The Bible records all of a sudden a chariot of fire splits Elijah and Elisha. Horses from heaven, the hosts of heaven, drive between the prophet and his apprentice right there. Man, fire separates them. And Elisha looks over and a whirlwind grabs Elijah and he goes straight up into the heavens. And I'm telling you, he goes into the heavens, but when he goes to the heavens, he doesn't take everything he owns with him. Because the Bible records that his mantle fell down from that whirlwind right in front of Elisha. And Elisha picks up that mantle, picks up the power of God, goes to the Jordan River, says, where is the God of Elisha? Throws it down, boom, and the Jordan River parts. And he steps into a miracle ministry that's twice as strong as Elijah. Elijah has 14 recorded miracles. Elisha has 28 recorded miracles. You know what my prayer is for our sons and our daughters? That they double everything that we do in this world. That they go higher than we ever go. That there's more miracles. There's more salvations. Come on, somebody. There's more finances flowing. There's more authority. There's more honor in their lives than there's ever been in ours. See, the God of the, pro the prophet of God... He had to go. Because a prophet's a man, but a man of God, right? Every man's going to go, aren't they? Doesn't matter how great they are, they're going. Right? See, the prophet of God has to go. But the God of the prophet, he stays right here. Billy Graham had to go, but the God of Billy Graham is right here with us, amen? Reinhard Bonnke had to go, but the God of Reinhard Bonnke, he's still right here. Oral Roberts had to go, but the God of Oral Roberts is still right here. Kenneth Hagin had to go, but the God of Kenneth Hagin is still right here. D.L. Moody had to go, but the God of D.L. Moody is still right here. Finney had to go, but the God of Finney is still right here. Peter and Paul had to go, but the God of Peter and Paul, they're still right here. Now I'm telling you, if you can pass those tests, man, the tests of the old, the test of on-the-job training, the test of offense. It's the biggest thing I see that we really need to pass in the modern church is the test of offense. Everybody's offended, aren't they? So easily. About nothing and everything. All together at the same time. You know, the Bible says if you love the word, you take not offense. And then I'll preach at a later time, but Elisha gets into walk, walk into the test of operation where he takes everything a previous generation's given him, and he's going to steward over it wisely. You know what we're going to do? We're going to steward over everything God's given us wisely in our generation because a previous generation fought too hard to get us to where we are. Come on, let's give that previous generation a hand clap for getting us <laughs> to where we are. Amen. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to pray. I said I'd anoint everyone in here with oil. It's the last night of our conference, but it's not the last night of revival this year. 2020 is a year it's going to be marked with revival. You're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles. You're going to see the prophetic at another level. You're going to see salvation at another level. You're going to see growth at another level. Henderson, hear the word of the Lord. God says for you guys to get your sights on 300 people with you. Y'all start to believe together for 300 It's your next limit. Get your sights on it. Come on, lift your hands to heaven. Get your sights on 300 people with you on Sunday morning. 
If you start to work together by faith, you'll break that barrier faster than you thought possible. Come on, our goal is 300. Come on, somebody say, we believe. God's multiplying Henderson to over 300 people. We believe, come on, let's say it. We're gonna do the work, partner with the Spirit, and see it happen in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap for that. Hear the word of the Lord. John Tatum, your word knowledge thing's gonna go up to another level. Supernatural knowledge, lift your hand. Supernatural knowledge is coming your way. Word knowledge is coming to y'all's house at a higher level. And, and, and you're gonna learn to operate in it. You're gonna have to watch it for a while. You'll learn to use it, right? Learn to use it and, and, and test it a little bit, right? You're gonna start hearing things. You'll, you'll start hearing directions. You'll start hearing things about people. And you're gonna test it and see and you'll, you'll begin to know what's God and what's me. The word of God's gonna come as a dividing asunder between soul and spirit. Word of God helps you prophesy, doesn't it, Pastor Rand? Helps you. Helps you know what's me and what's God. Word of the Lord's going to do that in you. And that, that I release that word knowledge thing into your life. Into your life. Take it into your life. Take it into your life. Take it into your life. In Jesus' mighty name. Now, here's what we're going to do. I want y'all to come, ushers, come and help. And we're going to, everybody that wants to be prayed for, I'm going to anoint you with oil that I believe we're going to have an oil to pass every test in 2020. We're going to have an oil to pass every test in 2020. Now, I'm going to come and I'm going to release something into your life. So y'all come, make a line down here and around the sides if you have to, and I'm going to come to you and pray. I'm going to come to you and I want you to get your faith up, get your expectation up. Go ahead, worship team, y'all come or get ready to, to lead us. Now, I want, I want y'all to lead us. I want all my pastors to come with me right here. We're going to lay hands on you. God's going to release something into your life. How many of y'all believe God's taking you to another level tonight? Does anybody believe that? I want, I want to pray. How many of y'all believe God's taking you to another level tonight? I want to pray for people that are ready to receive. I said it again. How many of y'all believe God's taking you to another level tonight? All right, let's worship the Lord together.